I love one woman, but I adore 11 men. I think the, the very first memory, the first game I ever attended was in, in 1986. It was the, uh, the cup game against Derry City. Um, my dad took myself and my younger brother. Um, I suppose I would have been 14 or so at the time. My brother would have been about 11. And uh, my dad took us along to the lodge. The, the biggest disappointment from that day was the fact that my dad made us leave. Five minutes to go, we missed the ball. First games for me was late 80s, around 88, 89. I went to one all night in 85 with the brother, like when he came back from England, but I just, I just couldn't grasp into it at, at that time. It was only like 13, 14, doing other things. It was um, a game against Sean McRaw was in 98, 99 season, I think. I think it was that anyway. Uh, Raw was beat us. But I didn't really get into Cork City since, but I, read, I got into Cork City around 93, 94. But I kind of fell out again for a year or two, and then I went back into it in 96. In the 86 down Flower Lodge, we were playing the semi final cup. All our teams qualified because yeah. we were beating the semi final by Shaw Rovers, as far as I can remember. And I remember my cousins, they're from up north, when they called to house at half seven that morning, beating down the door, <laughs> looking for the breakfast. So we all had a the game anyway, and we won one in down Flower Lodge. 
Yeah. So I remember going back down and out to the lodge for the first year probably now and the miserable cold weather and the clubhouse behind the goal at the end of it opened there and the rides were on so we went in there the old boots came off the legs up against the old ride there and all of a sudden it was some old fella, old fella from the AOH or something they presume out there and get out of that so you were forced to watch the football like, but then so you, you learn to love it in that way like there's earliest memory anyway of it um very vague early memories to be honest um started going Garrick when Garrick Conan came back from, from England and uh, my mum was teaching him at the time so just sort of started wandering along to the odd game or two and uh, we used to stand down the corner where the corner boys are or where the corner boys were and um, then after that sort of wandered into the shed and that was it like once I got into the shed I was hooked there was no keeping away from the place. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard the song The Fields of Bishopstown which I thought was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. Now obviously, when you hear it for the hundredth time, it loses its power, but you know, for the first time for someone who'd never been to a City match before, it was a, it was a pretty powerful moment. I remember ringing loads of people and saying, they sing the song, Low Live, it feels the Bishop's Town, and I was trying to remember the words. The first game would have been sometime in 84, but I haven't a clue who to have been. Um, I went, I think I went around, it was around Christmas, 84, and uh, I mean, I'd been to like Celtic and Hibs games with my dad, and. Cork United then, or no, it was Albert Rovers for a while and then Cork United. But uh, I think I was too young to care about the football, it was all about the, you know, the crisps and the bottle of tenor and stuff. But uh, I remember the first time I went down, I was just couldn't believe how, how bad it was. it was. The football was shocking because, as you know, there was like a gap of a few years and you kind of have to acclimatise yourself to League of Ireland football. I've got vague memories of being out in the lodge by Turner's Cross, been out there on a Sunday afternoon, pissing rain about 30 people standing in the shades. It was just brilliant. The first game I was ever in Turners Cross was in the shed. Like, and I'd been to the stadiums around the place loads of times. I came from a GA family, but it was my first time in Turners Cross. And I was simply, I was what, 16 years old, 92, 16 years old. I was blown away simply by the atmosphere. I followed the world no matter how bad the club was, like, in Cork. You know, and there were some bad teams there, like. I mean, like, Turners Cross today, you know, for me, I can remember being out there, I went out there one time and I remember there was a lot of blocks bought out. We're going to build, we're the only four standards now, right? Someone said, we're going to build a standard. They didn't ask me what year it was, right? So they, these blocks came in and they were left there. And you know what we were using for, for, for the, that season? The standard, so we gave a better view. The stand never materialised, like. It never happened. And one by one, then the blocks, the blocks disappeared. Bishopstown era. I hated the place. Absolutely hated the place with a vengeance. Because um, for me, I, I lived in Parklands, and you hop on the number three bus in Parklands, and you arrive outside Tornos Cross. So it was handy, like, right? at the time, obviously, like, I was a student and stuff, and all that, so obviously, didn't have a car. For Bishopstown then, but moving on, it was kind of like such a hassle to get there, for me, like, personally, and it was like, 
it really was no man's land at the time it, was, it probably still is even now like even though you have the greyhound track and stuff out there but it really was very inaccessible at the time some people say that it was a vision of pat donovan's that was like 10 years too early when you look at the infrastructure out the west side of the city now what are your thoughts on it it's like the visions that there was quite a lot of mushrooms out there in them days all right wasn't there <laughs> they ruined a very good mushroom plant <laughs> Well, Bishopstown, I'm actually from Bishopstown, so Bishopstown's dead handy for me, but uh, I hated it, needless to say. Um, it was just it was just wrong. It was just wrong. I think no, no matter what way you dress it up, I mean, the spiritual home of Cork soccer is Turner's Cross. And I mean, like, like my very first game was a Cork Celtic game at Turner's Cross. And, like, you know, you know, if I bring my kid to a game I want it to be a Turner's Cross and um, the whole like let's move out to a greenfield site to build a stadium thing has reared its head again and I just think it's a load of bollocks to be honest because it's it's just not going to work when you look at it now like you're driving in out that link road and you're looking you see one stand and a beautiful green base and you see the lads training and you're saying that's home because no matter what people say Turner's Cross is too small for us because we're we're, we're like, we are the biggest support club in the country. This is a thing that has to be cashed in on by the people in the club. We are the biggest supported club in the country. We have massive potential. We are the one team in the city. We deserve a ground that's bigger than seven or 8,000 seats. You know, so Bishopstown, the, the, the potential for Bishopstown is massive. But the thing to remember is that Bishopstown came 12 years too soon for, for what we have now. I couldn't really understand it, to be honest, you know, it, it just seems like a bridge too far, but when you look out there now, and you see the infrastructure that's built up around it, and you see how well the Greyhound track's doing yeah. on pretty much the same plot of ground, you kind of, you have to kind of ask yourself, was it just that bit ahead of its yeah. time? Even if you look at the amount of people that are living out that direction now, there's a huge crowd out there that, that maybe Turner's Cross isn't tapping into, but uh, yeah, may, maybe, if, maybe it was a few years too early, to be honest, like for us. But. You know, even, even people who say, it was ahead of its time and that it was just never going to work it was just never going to work it, it it doesn't have the we we get it it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to describe right but but we get it with, with venues like we go all over the world and you can't build the perfect venue because each venue has like a magic of its own and the place could be I mean Sir Henry's was a brilliant venue and there was like slime pouring down the walls it was like you know it was filthy and dirty and sweaty and damp and everything and technically it shouldn't have worked but it had a magic and you know sometimes I bang on about this to people and they look at me as if I'm a spacer like how can a place have a magic but it does and I think Turner's Cross has it and I think Daily Mount has it and Daily Mount is like completely it's like a disaster but it's got something you feel that you're part of history Tolka has it to an extent the showgrounds in Sligo has it um, UCD should just Belfry should just be levelled. Forget about that. Um, but you know there are there are grounds that work and there there are grounds that don't work. With the training facilities that I could see that could be put there with with that much you know ground, uh, you know all weather pitches and that. I, I I thought it was the way to go with Cork City. You know, unfortunately, we were sinking out there as the season progressed because uh, the pitch was so bad. And uh, it, it makes me laugh really because uh, Pat, I remember I went to, I travelled to Shells last year. Uh, it was the second or third last game of the season and I went up uh, with a couple of buddies when we drove up and I met some of the supporters coming back and uh, one of them said to me, uh, Dave, um, you know, mad about City, we follow City everywhere and he says, uh, but I never followed you in Bishopstown and I looked at him and I said, why didn't you follow us in Bishopstown? It's too far out and I asked him, did you go up to the Satanta uh, game up in Portadown? I did. You're up in, up in Dublin on a Friday night. They did. And I says, you wouldn't go to Bishopstown. You know, I suppose fans, you know, they either love a stadium or they don't. I think the infrastructure was wide open, windy, rainy nights. I think the summer soccer has helped, you know, immensely as well for to getting the crowds back, you know. But I think, you know, it, it didn't take off with the fans. But I, I think to this day, I think it was, uh, it was very disappointing. It didn't it collapse because, uh, you know, if you look, look around the league now, like uh, clubs are selling their grounds to stay in football and you know t to think that Cox City could have that ground out there with, with a big infrastructure as guard train facilities would have been marvellous. Who was it that um, had, had, had some sort of relations in the centre circle? Do we have a name there? Oh, oh, it was actually a friend of a friend of mine the night well, before it opened. What you, he had, um, shall we say, 
Karen and knowledge with a girlfriend, so he was the first one to score in Bishopstown. <laughs> they had, I had taken a half day to watch them one week to win a cup match or a league match, whatever it was. I took a half day from work, particularly to go to Ireland to Bishopstown, right? And they lost, right? So the following week, they were playing again on a Wednesday, and I swore I'd knock one off, and I didn't. Just in pure spite. So the next, they happened to be playing three games in a row, and then we lost again the next game, and um, Tony O'Sullivan, remember Tony O'Sullivan, yeah. used to be in Barber City. We used to be standing behind the dog, you see, and all the men, he was there, and they had and all that. I said, they're giving us what for, and then Tony turned around to me. He says, You want fucking here last fucking Wednesday? He says, We didn't hear you were on. And I walked back, This is no, the match was going on, I know, like, and on the dugout, I turned around. I says, I, I took a fucking half day the week before, I said, and you were beaten. I certainly wasn't going to do it last week, I said. I said, you're costing me money, you know? And we had this conversation, slagging what's going on. Clock row, we were getting, we were getting the rock and stuck at him. The, the dog over, we were telling him to shove off, and the match was going on. No one watching the match. <laughs> you know? No one watching the game. the most talented player to play for City. I tell you, in recent times, I actually think that uh, the Mick Devon has been outstanding. <laughs> Do you want to turn around there and just show the camera to Jersey? Yeah, just, uh... <laughs> I mean, that pretty much says it all. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I'd, go, I'd go with George as well, like, you know, George is an impressive player in fairness, like, you know, as they said, like, he had a lot of flair with him, like, you know, but then, you know, we just kind of have to move on, like, and, uh, you know, I, I'm starting to really warm to Roy O'Donovan, you know, he's starting to get it, you know, he's, he's impressed me over the last few games and, you know, and he's shown his ability to score goals and that's, and at the end of the day, that's what it's about, like, you know. But for me, it has to be Dave Valley, like. One of the stories was that there was a, a kind of a young fella brought over on loan from the UK, you know, and he was, uh, it was pre-season or something like that, and um, it was like, uh, Patsy was a sub. This young fella was a sub or whatever, and they were kind of. This young fella was doing all the stretches and warming up, running up and down the line, trying to impress the manager or whatever, and trying to get on and get a run. And uh, Patsy was standing in the corner of the double like, and uh, next to. I don't know who was the manager, Tim could have been Dave, you know, or someone, and they said, uh, you know, linesman, uh, substitution, substitution. This young fella starts stripping off or whatever. They said, Patsy, come on, you're on. And Patsy went, <laughs> stubbed out the fag and ran out, but the Christian young fella just left her going, what the fuck do I have to do to get on here? Patsy, I think. Because yeah. I think Patsy, you know, he had he had the skill, uh, but he had that kind of glint in his eye. I think Patsy was kind of the, the guy who, if he hadn't been playing, he would have been up in the terraces with everybody else. And by the same token, if we'd been on the pitch, that's what we'd like to have been. Even down to like the little off the ball incidents <laughs> occasionally, like that he was capable of throwing in, you know, and like they, he never gave up. I, I, just like, and in terms of the ability he had as well, I, I think, you know. For a very small guy as well, he was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've kind of vague recollections of Donny Madden, all right? Um, but um, I just couldn't figure out how he would stay on the pitch, like, and get through 90 minutes. But uh, Dave Barry, I suppose, was, was, the, was the, the player. He was just, you know, pure class. And um, Patsy Frayne as well. And, uh, like, I used to love John Caulfield, to be honest. I... There was like I think there was always it was it was always weird it was always like you were either a Pat Morley fan or a John Caulfield fan, and for some reason you weren't allowed to be fans of both of them. You had to you had to make a choice. So I was always Caulfield. What was your funniest moment of all following the city? 
Oh, that's great wit. I just, if I hear witty re remarks, I just get jealous because I didn't think of them myself, so I deliberately forget them. My foot, well, well, I suppose there's been lots of them, but the one that sticks out was in March of 92. Quarter final of the FAI Cup at home to Limerick and uh, Moses, I had to do with Moses at the time. I know you'll be interviewing him later for this, so he'll probably give me his own take on it, but uh, it was uh, Moses and didn't really like Carver Cotter. Now, Carver wasn't the the most gifted player we ever had, but he, he, he gave 110%. Like, <laughs> I used to try. Carver Cotter got a man to match one day. I don't ask me know how he got it. Like, you know, he used to get it off. The poor man used to get it off a slagging. Like, he was neighbour of mine one time in County Road, and he actually moved to Torquil, you know. And I never realised it until I saw his parents have opened the class one day and I see Karma with him. And I says, that's never the Karma cut that they were next door to me for all those years, you know. I'd grown up, like, and played for Cork City, you know. But, uh, no, he was, he was terrible. So, what happened was, we, Davy Barry put us one up in the first half until he said that's it. We played into the shed in the second half. We were one up and we were comfortable-ish, but you know the way, there was always a bit of nervousness there at 1-0 and you were kind of, Limerick were pushing on and we were kind of going, supposed to be weak and then we're you know, under pressure so excuse me they break away anyway ball lobbed over the top from a Limerick attack Cotter through one on one with the keeper and the anticipation they said as he's getting there and there to go he gets to the edge of the box and next Moses no not Cotter full sure he was going to miss like and he just Dinked it up over the keeper. Keeper went to ground, dinked it over the keeper into the net and came over in front of the shed like this. As if to say, fuck you, what? And 2 0 the game was in the bag, and I'll never forget that. We laughed and laughed so much because like, Moses didn't like him, and he was like, not Carter! Anyone but Carter, like, and then he just, for such a class finish, oh, it was just so, so funny. How about the best banners? What? Cork versus Shells. Uh, uh, Over Dublin, wasn't it? Yeah. No, no, no. no. Yeah, St. Anne's in. Judas on the bench. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Match ticket 15 euro. Yes, one gram, three euro. Judas on the bench, priceless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the best I've seen ever in football. I've been for years. Nothing like that. Another cracker was a, a visit by Shamrock Rovers to the, to the cross. And uh, as we all know, Rovers have had no home since. 1880-something. <laughs> and I think there's a lovely fountain in the middle of Milltown in their housing estate, but I'm not here to glow it. <laughs> but they were in the middle of being after being thrown out of somewhere else to go somewhere else, and they arrived in Turner's Cross for their home game against us. And next to you, across the back of the shed, this banner unfurled. This is not a halting sight. I thought that was a cracker. Like. I think it was uh, maybe 80, in mid-80s, and uh, we were six down at half time. We couldn't. <laughs> Eamon O'Keefe was manager. And uh, we w I'll never forget walking off the pitch at half time. The crowd, the stick we got coming off the pitch. I just, we, if, we got out, if, we could, if the team bus was open, we were going to get on the bus and go home because it was just one of those nightmare scenarios. Six down at half time. And uh, I'll always remember Eamon O'Keefe. Uh, we walked into the, the dressing room and there was a, a young guy called Norman Kelly. Uh, playing with us at the time and Norman was eating eating a burger and chips in the corner of the dressing room like at that time you'd have uh, you'd have 14 men you know and we'd, you'd bring a 15 in case one of the lads got sick on the bus and things like that I think it was a pippy there was a couple of us wanted to get sick at half time not go out but, uh, but the smell of just burgers and chips in the dressing room you're coming in oh it was a situation we were so you know the sweat was dripping off we were just chasing these people all day you know the first half and then to go in into a dressing room there six nil down and the smell of burgers and chips but i remember eamon was playing the same day he was playing with me in the middle of the park and uh, when we walked in he just screamed at norman get rid of it you know get out get rid of that and, you know throw it in the bin but no it was only awful at the time and i'd say it was his last pocket money it must have been because he on the way out, as Eamon was just berating him, got out the restroom, he was trying to eat the burger before he actually, he would, didn't want to throw it away, he was eating it. But uh, as we sat down, I always remember, uh, he was Ginger Healy playing the same day, and Eamon turned and he says, it's all your fault. This was going on, he kind of half played Ginger, and Ginger was playing wide in the right. 
And I was saying, that how could he blame somebody playing wide in the right? And we were just torn apart the whole game. We weren't involved in the game at all, but it was Rovers against Post game. I think it was in Inchicore. And the Rovers Ultras, I mean, they're amazing, some of the displays they do. But this one, what they did was they, they got a big cardboard, big sheet of cardboard and cut it out in the shape of a toilet bowl. And then they had a banner with each, the name of each Bowes player on it. And they symbolically flushed each one of them down the toilet before a kickoff. And it was just the sheer effort and organisation that went into it. It was fantastic. It was really, really brilliant. Like. But it's actually, for some reason, the, the, the banner that stands out to my mind the most is actually a banner that was unfurled by opposition fans in Turners Cross. Pats fans actually had a big, huge red thing with white writing on it and written across was, if you can read this, you're not from Cork. And I just thought it was simply, it was just pure, that's, that's the Cork humour, pure pull the piss over us. And we laughed, you know, there was no resentment, no hassle, no bitterness about it. It was just pure bastards, they beat us to it when we've loved to have done that to them, like, you know. Um, I think, like, what... The plank, I, I, I presume people have mentioned it here before, but the plank was just hilarious. I mean, like the, the, the poor bloke, I, I even forget who it was. I think, I think it was against shells. I'm not sure, though. It was like it's been lost in the, the midst of the memory. For, for, a long, for a while, I heard people, when people got injured, you know, you'd expect Nina, Nina, you know. But sometimes you'd hear people saying, uh, uh, bring out the plank, bring out the plank. And... Uh, I didn't know why. Obviously, like everything else, I just started singing it myself, you know. A lot of times I really didn't. In fact, it took me years to get all the words of Low Lie, The Fields of Bishopstown. And actually, to be honest, the first time I heard it, I didn't even know why they were singing The Fields of Bishopstown. I didn't even know what the connection was, except that it was my last name. So uh, anyway, bring out the plank, bring out the plank. So for ages, I was saying it. And then finally, I, 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 I said to somebody, like, what's the story with the plank? And... Uh, they said that there was some match in Dundalk years ago, like when, you know, before the Celtic Tiger and all, like before we had stretchers and ambulances, like, you know, and uh, somebody got injured and they didn't have a stretcher, so they actually brought out like a plank or two planks or something and they stretched this guy off in the plank. It was just when that came out, I mean, that, that just summed up League of Ireland at that stage, you know, and I mean, just that chant when I, whenever I hear, and in fact, I remember being in the shed about three years ago, and like some fella got injured and there was kids in front of me, they couldn't have been more than like 12 or 13 and they were chanting, bring on the plank. And I mean, they weren't even born when the incident happened and I'm, I'm pretty sure they didn't know exactly what happened, but it was still like, it was just, it was just class. Like. You know, it's funny, bring out the plank. I'd say some, uh, some kids that don't know the story expect Pat Kenny to come out and start giving somebody mouth to mouth resuscitation. <laughs> you know what I was, um, like, I was actually talking to some guys here walking in and <coughs> the away fans, a lot of the away fans would would come into the shed, you know, before. Oh yeah. And there was one instance in particular. I came into into the shed, and uh, Richie was there from from mine. Richie says, "Have a look." There was two boys fans there. And I said, "That's what are you doing here?" Yeah, we're here to watch the match. I know. Yeah, it's like long enough. We got some. So you can't be in here. This is the Cox City end, like. Yeah, hey, we're staying here. This has seen the way boys, you see. So I stood behind them anyway, and that's says, "You leave them there." No. So just before the game started, just started singing. So I caught, I caught the two by the neck and, my, and ran along the steps of the shed. Of course, they made a, they made a run for me, what have you. So the girls were there, the stewards were called, and the boys, the stewards and the girls, they said, what are you doing here? I said, you should be done with it. Oh, we can watch the match where we want to. I said, you know, I didn't wish going to the shed. You know, and the boys were cheering and they were all cheering, and they were Moses and all this, and they got a moment, you know. But like, if you did that in, in daily motion, you'd be lynched. Yeah. You wouldn't do it anyway, like. Like the shed, like the shed, the shed has a great, had a great character about it, like you know what I mean. And it was intimidating, and that's the best thing I loved about it. It was so intimidating. Players wouldn't go against it, especially goalkeepers. Yeah. But a lot of time with these players as well, you would have a, a, a grudging admiration for them at the same time as well, like was. But that was it with Paul Wheeler, like you'll never be your brother, or even you'll never be always at his uncle as well, wasn't it, like? To, uh, but to say these fellas, say, that's what makes it all part of it as well, is having these fellas as you go out there and you love to, like, tis the same with fellas who've left City, like, tis great when they come back. Reynolds now coming back, Cal, Carney, all these come back, tis, it makes it all enjoyable, like, that you can, you, you, you go out there and, you, 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 tis good, like, the hate, the hate is great, like, tis, but after the match then, let me say, like, tis, you'd hear then about, was it last time when Cal was down here and he got a load of, grief outside the match and that, that's getting carried away then you don't you you, you give it loads when they're playing and call you, 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 that's enough there then like it's enough for that thing it's called friendly fire <laughs>
a couple of questions for you. Oh, she's <laughs> Where's that hide money, is it? Come here, <laughs> Can you tell me who's your favourite Cork City player? Danny Murphy. Uh, Patsy Crane. No, they don't. Any particular story about Patsy? Everyone, um, has, a, everyone has a Patsy story. Uh, I think the best thing uh, about Patsy is his fear of flying. Uh, at all. His fear of flying. He's no fear on the pitch, but when I'm the player, it's, it's the one really, you know, everybody talks about. I've seen footage of Patsy when Cork has travelled abroad in European games, and you'll see the fear in his face. But when he's on the pitch, or when he was on the pitch for Cork City, he was just fantastic. Great yeah. man to pass the ball. What's his name? Where did this whole thing come from? I don't, I don't know where it came from. It came from the shed, like, you know. I don't know, I don't know where he got it from, but, like, they, they, they started off, and I just have a bit of crack when it comes down. It's, it's, the thing is, there's no harm in having a bit of banter with this. Man. You still concentrate on their game, but you can still have a bit of banter as well, like, you know. Um, there have been some greats there. Conor O'Brien from the current squad, uh, the John Coffey, of course, the Pat Morley's, the Big Hink, Biscuits, yeah. another legend. Yeah. That's a stack of them. There's, there's the top 20. One more, favourite game. Favourite game of all City. time. Uh, I suppose winning the league in 1993 was a fantastic one. But I suppose the best of all had to be the, um, the, the Cup replay in 1998. Uh, do you want to see a grown man cry? Check the video. John, thanks a million. Pleasure to meet you. you too. What game do you most look forward to every season, guys? Shell. Long first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shell Bond Trump, definitely. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's the big, it, it is the big rivalry, and now it'll draw, there, there seems to be this thing building with Drahad, I know as well, like, but Shelburne at home, or Derry, Derry at home, because of the fact of the, Derry bring a great support, and um, I, uh, I always enjoy Derry supporters, uh, great band with them, last year before the final game of the season inside the corner house, I mean, if this, if this was English football, you're talking about trouble, two sets of supporters, there was banter, there was singing, there was dancing, hats, flags, banners, what more could you ask for, like, you know what I mean? What was your, the best game you've seen City play, or the more, maybe the, the best moment? It might have been City their best, but I think the 2 nil away in Lithuania when we beat Ukrainis, that was, I, that was probably up there for me, because that was the UEFA Cup. We didn't really know what to expect from them. They didn't turn out to be as good as we thought, but we went away in Europe, and for the first time, we completely dominated a team. Mm. Like, you know, they, they never got close to us that night, and just, we, were, we were fantastic. Like games themselves, I suppose you had the four-all draw against Shelburne, which I suppose everybody will say was a classic game from a footballing perspective. From a Cork City team effort perspective, you've got different things like the game. Was it standard Liège where the boys were doing the can-can and you had a chance to come out of the shed? So you've different reasons for different things. I, 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 it was probably three or four, maybe five years ago that I went to the, I went to the, the shed for the first time. And uh, again, it was just about the crack for me. I didn't know many of the players. Like slowly but surely, I got to know them. But uh, it did inspire a bit of a, a bit of material for me because I was doing I, I was doing court gigs a lot then down in city limits, and uh, I was desperate for material. And I think I went to a match one day, and then I had a gig that night. And uh, they weren't doing Friday night matches at that time. I think this was a, a Saturday afternoon anyway. And uh, I went. I, I did the gig and. Uh, I didn't really have material, but I know I had been sniffing snuff <laughs> at, the, at the match. And, you know, it's a strange thing to hear an American accent in Turner's Cross. You know, it's not like there's a huge sort of American supporters club for a Cork City FC. And uh, I was just joking about the fact that the first couple of times I shout out, like, come on, Cork City! <laughs> and everybody would be looking at you like, who the fuck is your man? Like, shut the fuck up, you don't even know what you're on about. And I didn't, I really felt a little uncomfortable and I didn't feel like I fit in. And then uh, my friend Ian took out some snuff. <laughs> And uh, I had a bit of snuff, and once the snuff went in my nose, I was like, Come on, for fuck's sake! Get stuck in, Carl, you fucking traitor, yo! One of, one of the games that sticks out in my mind for just sheer crack and sheer emotion is when we won the League Cup against Rovers. Again, it was, I think it was the 30th of December or something, yeah. uh, 1999 yeah. or something like that. It was the year after we won the FBI Cup. It was Cup December 1999, yeah, it was the same year and, uh, as the Noel Harting got a cracking goal, a ball, like, just pinged back yeah. and forth all the way up the pitch. And he kind of slid it home into the shed end and yeah. just to do it against Rover. I think Tony Dog was sent off in the same game well, as well, wasn't he? Kick Johnny C, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's stupid. Yeah, yeah. 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 Helvin missed the penalty then. Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it was just a great night. It, yeah. it was a mud bat of a pitch and 
had been lashing rain all morning. Yeah, that's so right, yeah. Just perfect. I sat down and I was thinking, one through it, best games. Like, you could talk about cup finals now, right? You could talk about uh, league cup finals, you could talk about European games. But I'd say you were at this game, and it only happened two years ago, as far as I can remember. Two, three years ago, if I'm wrong. And they were losing two nets to Rovers outside in Thomas France. And the Rovers fans were really giving it big time, you know, and, uh, and we were going, Jesus, we're going to be smacked all over here, whatever. And yeah. um, then he brought on, it was Liam Murphy, his manager, and James Mulligan came on. And all of a sudden, bang, and bang again, you know what I mean? It, it was too all, you know? And they came back and won 3 2. For me, because it was first of all, it was Rovers, mm -hmm. right? And the way it was done. What a lot of fellas don't realise is that we actually have been voted twice the UEFA Cup of the week, or Team of the Week. Um, I think it was about two years ago was the first time when, when Pat Dolan joined the Intertoto. And to me, like, a, a small club like Cork City, granted a lot of bigger clubs hadn't entered the competitions at that stage, so we, we had a friendlies, but the fact that we got recognition off UEFA for such a small club from a backwater place when it comes to the soccer standards, like we got recognised as UEFA Cup of the Week, or UEFA Team of the Week. It's after me, it's like, geez, no, just finally recognition in our own place. And that, that means something like that. Any Cork person is shot to be proud of the fact that their team has been recognised. Even if, if you're a Man United supporter living in Cork, you should be recognised. That is an amazing achievement. Like The Shells game away, there's no doubt about it. We went into a round robin situation. And, you know, I think with the experience in that side, it was a, a situation where it only happened in a couple of times, maybe in my GA career as well, where we've been beaten. That uh, when we went up to Dublin, no matter what was thrown at us, we were going to come back with the cup. That uh, you know, and uh, you know, you know, we went behind, and then you know, we uh, went behind again, and it went we went ahead uh, two one. I got the second, and uh, when Paul Bannon got the goal to make it three two and, and and bring the league down to the city it was fantastic. Yeah. Well, Rovers, a great one. It's like it's a, uh, and that <laughs> actually talking about away games. That Rovers away game, which was at the cross. I mean, that was. That was a panic. Like I mean, you, I say you wouldn't get that in any other league, but um, Rovers is always good. And uh, I mean, I suppose Shells recently, the, the the Pats games were brilliant when when Pats were, when Dolan was managing them and when Pats were like doing really well. There was some great uh, ding dongs. The um, the Shells four four, I think. Christmas. Oh, Christmas. What year was that? now? ninety nine was it? I, whatever year it was. But that was amazing. That was such an up and down game. And I mean, I was like so destroyed when I went to 4-4. I was like, I was like praying that there'd be no more goals, whether it be us or them. I just couldn't handle it anymore. I was just destroyed from that. But um, the, um, it's a pity Ramblers aren't aren't up there. Because, like in in the Premier League, because like Ramblers are always a good away trip as well. But uh, I suppose the Dublin team's coming on. And Derry, Derry, Derry is always a good game too. The Der that Derry Cup, the Derry Cup, uh, semi-final a couple of years ago that was, that was a brilliant game in the cross as well so and of course last year's game was unbelievable unbelievable you were actually doing a gig that night I think weren't you, you were saying yeah so the night the night that uh, that city won the league I unfortunately had to do a gig in Vicar Street in front of a thousand people and uh, as I said like I'd grown like I was really I'd gone to a lot of matches towards the end of the season I was sick over not being able to go and um, my gigs start at half eight Right. And what I normally do is I do like 25 minutes to a half an hour and uh, bring on the first act and then he does the rest of the half and then there's a break and then I do my thing. So if I if I remember correctly, the, the match started at eight o'clock. Yeah. So we didn't we didn't start the show until quarter to nine that night instead. Right. So I watched the whole first half. Then I went out. And I did 15 minutes, knowing that the break of the match would be 15 minutes. Now, we have to remember that uh, the, these people paid 25 euros to see me. Like, you asked me there about, like, uh, about um, my best memory in Europe. And some people would have their, their own opinions. But for me, it would have been the previous round. You know, they played Comprend Town. Was that 93? I'm bad for years, you know. Um, that was amazing. Like, that was the European Cup. And... Uh, they were like three down at half time. And they came back to three two, and they said that's great. At least we're still with a fighting still chance. Yeah. Out to Thomas Cross, full house, right? Went another goal down. So that was four two, you know. And uh, they played into the sh into the shed in the second half, and uh, next thing they got to go back. Quarter no left. And if my memory serves me right, I'm not sure it was a Johnny Glenn. Johnny Glenn. Johnny Glenn. 
got the winner with about five minutes left, like, and, and the never just erupted, like, I mean, they went through the way it was. Like, Sweet would say, Bayern Munich, all right, yes, it, that was special as well, but it wasn't in Thomas Cross. Actually, Noel Feeney, I think, saved our lives that day, because uh, we were like, we, for some reason, we, we, like, we, we pooled all our money, and we were saying, like, this is what we'll do, and we'll buy a load of drink, and, like, you, you, you save the money, you take the money for the drink, and you take the money for the food. And uh, the fellow who had the money for the food lost the money. So we'd no grow up sufferable. Like, we got the boat over, whatever, and I think we slept rough, even. I don't know why we slept rough, because we were all, like, working. We could all afford to stay somewhere. We just... I think we forgot. We forgot to give someone, like, um, accommodation money or something like that. But, um, anyway, it was like, we were all starving, like. And, of course, the fellow who had the drink money wouldn't give any of the drink money to, to buy food. Like, we were all, like, famished, like, and... In the end, Noel could see it. We, we were like sitting on a wall or something. It was the day after the game. We lost, got two goals in the second half, and I uh, lost three two. And Noel came down. And she said, "Are you all right?" Let's move. Said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're starving." But like we, like bottles aside, are all right. Like we could afford them, all right. But uh, we're getting our priorities right. But uh, Noel went in anyway, and she'd like I think she'd befriended the hotel manager where the team was staying, and uh, he gave us all yesterday's desserts. So she came up with a big bag of desserts. So it was like chocolate gato and eclairs and everything. And we like scoffed them all down. So I never thanked her for that. So thanks, Noel, for the for the grub that day in Cumbran in '93. I think really the atmosphere in um, in the in the Galatasaray uh, uh, stadium at the time was fantastic. I remember walking into it. We used to get there probably an hour and three quarters before the game. And we used to, we came down under the under the stadium into in a bus, so we didn't actually see the pitch. And there was this kind of drone, a, a, a kind of hum that was going around the stadium. And you know, you'd be thinking it's uh, you know it's something to do with the uh, the boilers or something like that, or you know. The, but um, we actually walked out before the game, and there was it must have been twenty thousand supporters in the ground. Malmo really stands out for me, to be honest, because you know up to up to then we'd sort of been plucky losers and giving it a shot against bigger boys and all that kind of stuff and Malmo like we shook them in the home leg and then they, they were still cocky as hell going into the away leg they were sure they were going to do it you know that it just been an off day on their part and nothing decent on our part and when we went over there and when Liam Carney scored it was literally like you could write the headlines we'd arrived in Europe I don't know how I last on the trip <laughs> I honestly don't I started work on the Wednesday night at quarter past seven I was working nights at the time and I walked out at quarter seven the following morning, went straight to Cork Airport, met Pat up there, went to Gatwick, went to Prague, went straight to the match, went straight out, and I didn't know how I lasted that. But that wouldn't be one of the benefits, but the best one for me was definitely Malmo. Malmo, I think, yeah, Malmo and Prague. It was the first time the that we actually won both legs in Europe. Like we went into this big massive stadium, it was crumbling, it was made for the 92 European Championships in Sweden at the time and it was a massive stadium back then because like since I that way I'm watching soccer on telly or whatever you know and like when, when I went into it like I don't know I just you know, my, the heels on my back just stood up like you know and I said right so you probably are like you know Coxley you're playing and I think we were home first and we beat them and they were there they were all being cocky and stuff like that like you know and their fans inside the city centre have been very cocky whatever like but uh we stayed in Copenhagen and we had some crack in Copenhagen for four days we were there because we didn't went our own way you know? and like we went into this bar and um, it was a Scottish bar we went into it and we sat down like and then all of a sudden the lads walk into the same bar five minutes later and there's a huge gang of City fans in this bar totally unarranged totally by coincidence in this bar in the middle of Copenhagen a Scottish bar in the middle of Copenhagen a big massive gang of City fans there was this there was this one sitting there you know and Chinese going on like and Fucking fags no more. I'd say the time that we were there, she must have drank about 12 pints of salt. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fact. And for every pint of salt, she had about 10 fags. <laughs> and she was smart of fag, and she'd blown. <sighs> Trying to smoke into the arms coming up, you know. And like we were all getting a great laugh off, you know. We saved Tintin Dunnox, like we were just in stitches, all right, you know. You know, you've had a good uh, European away trip when the captain of the ferry comes down to kick you off it. Isn't that true, lads? When the captain of the ferry comes down to kick you off it, he actually came down. He said, we're here, we're in Swansea, could you please get off? And we said, we'd have one more, and we were ringing the bell and everything. Okay. Remember the Bulgarians? I do. For sure, your man even called him. Your man couldn't even call up their names, man. He was calling out number two was number two. 
you know? He, he, the, the, the guy, the, the call, call up teams on, you know? Number one, Phil Arrington. Number two was number two. And number three then, Stephen Yadro. Number four, number four. <laughs> he did, like, he didn't even guess it, like, you know? He just didn't make it, no attempt whatsoever. <laughs> but sure, was a disaster, like. You're renowned as one of the, the finest poets in Cork, but certainly most Cork City fans anyway. Well, I do my best. Two of my favourite poems are one you did after the trip to Prague, and another one was uh, one this season as well, called Relaxation Complexities. Doing Prague was the other one. Can we get you to recite one of those? Yeah, do the Prague. It's, uh, it's good memories of, uh, of Prague or whatever. When that shiny yellow ball emerged from the reefer's bag, our first round opposition would be the Slavians from Prague. We knew it would be tough, but we're not quite overawed. Another European trip with the grace and help of God. Every form of transport was used to get us there. Car and train, boat and plane, donkey, cart and fare. Rico couldn't make the trip, he had a lung infection. We took along another few to give the team direction. Skippy, Decky, Biscuits too. We're there to help Dave Hill. Rico had instructed them. Can you imagine the phone bill? A multitude of different routes were taken on the way for everyone to be there on that very special day. Gatwick, Stansted, Stockholm, Paris all housed our merry band. Some of us even ended up travelling through Dublin. With tables of the carry breezes and stories unbelievable, the rebel army settled in the numbers inconceivable. More arriving hour by hour on different shapes and creeds. The Charles Bridge March united all, even the Japanese. Now walking the streets of Prague wasn't quite like doing panna. We had ladies asking our lads if they could please blow their banana. There were men looking for Charlie. We said sorry, why not a clue? All we were really interested in was downing local brew. We lived on sterile pram and spicy sausage and mustard. Despite the quite pugnacious smell, we drove on undeterred. The taxis took us up the hill a hundred miles an hour, tailgating trams and beeping horns, our knuckles white as flour. We had fans appear from everywhere, gathering at the scene. The total final headcount was 819. The boys did battle proudly, we sang till we were hoarse. We belted out our every tune, and then the banks, of course. It was an honour and a privilege to stand there in that crowd, and sing and chant for Cox City, though beaten still on bold. Football is a cruel, cruel game, we didn't deserve the score. We clapped our heroes off the pitch, then clapped a little more. A lump had stuck there in my throat, a tear welled in my eye, for I know I am, I'm sure I am, I'm City till I die. City to one of the many soaps on television, which one would it be? I had to think about that, they're not really a soaps person, like, but uh, I was thinking about EastEnders because there's always drama, always drama in it, and, and, and uh, tears, lots of tears, you know. As if you can't go an episode without there being some, somebody crying, you know, about something. I don't watch soaps. I'm gonna say hold it away. That's for EastEnders. EastEnders. <laughs> it would, it would. Because there are times when it's absolutely brilliant, yeah. and the times when it's so bad you think, oh my god, what am I doing watching this? <laughs> Let me run and turn it over. <laughs> are, you saying, are you saying some of the characters in EastEnders were? Right? <laughs> oh no, it's more the performances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, EastEnders is too depressing. There's some, yeah. com there's some comic relief with Sydney in there, like so. I don't know, Carnation Street, like, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's a touch yeah. of the Jack and Fear about it at times. Like. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> and again, looking at, we'd say, City and comparing it to music, what music would you tend to associate with Cork City? Um, well, of course, City has always been closely kind of linked with the Cork kind of music scene and, 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 you know, Marty McCarthy was always, you know, he was still as a huge City fan, like, and, you know, he'd been in the Sultans of Ping and, um, the Frank and Walters were always at the matches, you had the guys under the Belsonic sound, you had Ian Richards and stuff like that, you know, you know, still goes to the games and, and, and 
but the one song for me is 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 Elvis Presley can't help falling in love with you because it just it just you know every time Elvis is singing like I can't help falling in love with you I just want to go stand up and go sing thing sing thing you know probably should have more respect for the king but you know that's just the way it is the Langer song then so I was just about to say the Langer song you know uh, as against Rovers as yeah um, the boy sang it in front of the shed like and, and that I know there was a big crowd yeah. so it was, it was easy 5,000 there like and of course as well the time the, the actual the band what are they called again? Natural, uh, natural, natural Gas yeah. yeah they played they, they played at half time in Turners Cross and it was a City and Rovers game yeah. and uh, the whole ground just joined in the shed and the Derry Nance stand and the corner boys and the Donny Ford stand and everything and uh, to a man when, when they came to the chorus like all pointed over the to Rovers and they were sitting there like livid like you know, it was a classic moment, like it was, like, but you had to be there, yeah, like, it was fantastic. you had to be there, you, 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 could, tell, you could tell people that, no, and they say, uh, yeah, I don't say anything funny in that, but when you follow Cox in and you hear Rovers, it was just a classic moment, like. There's a line in Fashion Crisis Hits New York, which says, um, I still like my old three-piece suite, but it's in the shed and I have no seat, and a few people kind of said, was that written about being in the shed and the, f the lack of seating in Turner's Cross at the time, but but it wasn't like. But I mean, if if people want to think that, they can, like. any particular refereeing decisions in the mind down through the years that was there that were notable, shall we say? Shell blown away in the Stanford Cup. Cup. There was no way that was, was open. Like. <laughs> the goal it never was. Yeah. I suppose you can't really look beyond handling up in yeah. in Chicor. <laughs> I'm sure everyone said that. And yeah. another one that got me was this year over in Cyprus. The, the stuff with Danny and Joe, I just, mm. I think that ref totally lost the plot. I don't think he knew what he was doing. Um, I reckon he was probably, in terms of impact, his was as great. I mean, okay, the one in Inchicor denied us the league title, but I mean, who knows what we were denied by what that fella did over in Cyprus. So I think it was, it was scandalous. And any decision Jimmy O'Neill took as well, any, any decision at all Jimmy O'Neill took. A refereeing decision that would stand out for me. And which was a bad decision, but it was, it was it wasn't exactly a, a terrible decision, but it's just the effect that it had was um, Dick O'Hanlon up in in Shakur in '99, sending off Kelvin Flanagan, and we had to lose the game one 0 and that's the that's the game that cost us the league. We beat Pats once that season. We did we won the league. It was actually similar to two yeah, years ago. Yeah. We beat Shells once. We won the league, and I remember just that night being up in in Shakur. There was a huge city following up there, and. Um, <laughs> Like the whole Camac side was Cork City fans and a bit of a stand as well. And um Dick O'Hanlon sent off Kevin Flanagan, which was kind of the change at the turning point in the game. And City went on to lose the game, went on to lose yeah. the league. Well, he has to be one of our own, Pat Kelly, I have to say. He's a Cork man. And he's actually turned around, I have to turn around to be a great friend of mine. But uh, I think uh, I was sent off twice in my career. And uh, Pat Kelly has sent me off twice in, in my career. And one I deserved because six of us were actually sent off when I played with Tremor uh, against the great Cove Ramblers team in the, uh, in the early 80s. They were Munster Senior League at the time and uh, there was an absolute war down in, uh, in our pitch in, 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 in Tremor, down by Carrigaline and uh, there were six of us sent off, could have been nine of us sent off. I think he got that decision right but uh, another, another decision he, he sent me off a back, back chat and uh, you know I was looking at Pat and I says he must have something against me but afterwards we have to become great buddies and uh, I think it's just uh, that competitive spirit I mean when I'm on the pitch I see no wrong you know but uh, what was the worst football jersey city there was what season was it I think it might have been 2000 2001 it was around then there was a red and white number a red jersey with the white stripe across the front of it the Lecoq one and I don't know, it mightn't have been the worst jersey in terms of what it looked like, but the quality of it was something shocking. Was that the shiny one? That shiny yeah. crap, yeah, it was dread. There was actually another one, the third jersey that season, that I don't it's know if they ever wore yeah. it, was practically fluorescent <laughs> pewed screen with the white stripe across the front of it, and that was awful as well. I'd say those two would probably be... I was going all jogging, I think, so you get knocked down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. The, the, I didn't particularly like the white one from last year either, it, and, and some of the players like, looked like they were wearing ball gowns or plunging necklines or something. It's no, my favourite jersey of all time. 
kind of serious man. That's I love terrible. it. Terrible. Love it. He was in the ball games though, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I, I think it must be must be something to do with uh, my my other passion being Real Madrid. But I just love white jerseys. I mean, th- this one I'm wearing now, and that that would be probably my two favourite of all time. I love them. Let's do this one here. Man. The pajamas. I know maybe you you may be known at the time, but the worst shot for me was the famous pajamas jersey like. I mean, that came into my head straight away. No other jersey, only that one, like it was horrible. Like if it was like if you put on you, the shorts and the jersey ah, ah, the shorts were, were, were t- together. It was, it was like one cup of tea suit, you know? It it was it was brutal, like. And no one liked it. And I think I'd say we got a year over it, you know. There's been a lot of dodgy ones, alright. I, I mean, I thought the initial one was a bit weird. The, the hoops, to start with, like, because that was like a Shamrock Rovers gear, which was a bit, a bit, a bit of a strange one. Although I don't know, do you remember like Queens Park Rangers were sponsored by Guinness, so the black and white pictures, we look like Queens Park Rangers. Um, but uh, I suppose the bit, the worst one actually was that, like, when 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 they moved to red, uh, the red one, um, when would that have been? Oh, whenever years again but um when i moved to red there was this like red kind of fleck one and it was really bad really bad i thought it was like i mean Ar- arsenal had a yellow kind of one with the fleck running through it was like a similar style to that and that one which had like the um the diagonal it was like the kind of diagonal to here wasn't too bad but the ones where they had the diagonal going going right down that was dodgy enough but i actually my favorite jersey is actually the one that that was called the quinsworth bag at the time do you remember the one where it had like um, uh, red and green stripes down? I actually like that. That was the one where, the, yeah, the pajamas one. When Johnny Glynn got got the winner against Cumbrand, it was like big big posts all around the city. But um, I actually, that, I think that's my favorite because it reminds me of um, there's a team in uh, Brazil. Is it um, Corinthians? Yeah, they have a, a similar, and I always like that gear as well. Like so. It was um. <coughs> a version of that one as well, but like that was the one the players wore. Yeah, which was nice material and things. Yeah, but the ones they the yeah, red one there, but the, <laughs> the ones this, the ones they showed in the shop were um, again the shiny kind of material <laughs> that you you put it in the wash once, and to be to turn into a big fluffy jacket or something. <laughs> and um, well, the pajamas wasn't too bad if it was with white shorts or green shorts, but the fact that they had stripes on the shorts as well. Sweet mothers of mercy! Must be a blind person designing the jacket thing in fairness. Like. Start singing he's God, the John O'Flynn, you know. <laughs> you kind of think you're a mass sometimes, you know, one of these uh, big prayer group meetings, but yeah, that'll be one that uh, you'll be thinking of. I like the stick they give Dan Connor, you know, Dan Connor, I know Dan Connor from my days with Peter and Walker, and he enjoys it as well because it's like. The big thing with the support in court, I mean, when I first got here, I, I sort of loved it, fell in love with the place, and, and the support was brilliant, you know. It's, it's just, it was just a pleasure to play in front of them, and it's a pleasure to play for a club like this, because, as I've said already, and I hate saying it again, I'm like a, a, a recording record here now, but you don't get fans like this, you know, and, and that's why they're so special. with a cup in your hand and you were, I think you were, the fans were trying to rip your shirt off and your shorts off and everything. I mean you wouldn't see the likes of that in the barn if we were in Stamford Bridge or whatever. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> true. I don't think I remember getting in with anything on anyway. So, yeah. you know, I did have quite a few items of clothing taken off me if anyone's got more like a back. I used to be wearing these alone with his tops and it looked a bit like a telly tubby in fairness with the smallness though. The lads used to give you a stick over that and they do the hokey pokey for them. So that's a special place to come, like you know, the sporters are great and they're nice people. I, I 
I'll never forget the day we came back here, and it was my first game back. And we played Pats in the, in the playoff, or not in the playoff, sorry, in a televised game. And I, I scored, and we went one up, and it was a very, very important game. And we ended up losing game, but I remember just jumping up in the wall. And I had the photograph home my wall. It was, it was just incredible because it was just like home I came, you know. Um, and lo and behold, the following week, I tried to do exactly the same, and I missed the wall and fell in. So. <laughs> A game, it was always to do with the shape because they were always spurring us on. When they're playing UCD and Brain, it's hard to get a result. They're always there, you know, singing along like and like getting that goal if you need, you know. And As I've always said, it's, it's probably great that summer football came on our back four, and this is my slag when I get into the lads, is when, when it's great when summer football came because the people over there in the far side there over by the St. Nans and, and over by, just by, what we call that over there, that's the far side of the shed, they are the Derry Nan Road area, they, they can have summer barbecues now because this team play football, you know, a lot of our fellas were started kicking it in and we used to always say we'll take the line out or we'll take a touch, you know, because they'd be booting the ball over there <laughs> and poor Finbar used to be chasing the ball. We, if we knew how to kill time, we'd just knock it back to the back four and they'd boot it into touch. Only joking, lads. What, what's your thoughts on the fanzine, John? The four four fanzine? Oh, I think it's, it's been great. Like, it's it was, Jerry Harris called it the Socratic horsefly there last year and it's kind of that thing like that, you know, it's kind of, I think, I think the club kind of do take notice to a degree, even if they wouldn't admit it, like the things that are said. Declan, the website, right, okay, you're an integral part of the website and all that. What, what part do you think the website plays in kind of the promoting of the club and even, you know, just the kind of the, the interest that it creates and so on? Just for a lot of the four of them, fifty thousand posts. <laughs> That's said uh, like a couple of years ago when there was no website for the club. I thought it was just so unusual, like for a, a supposedly full-time club to have it doesn't have a website. Like so, me and my brothers just said, let's go ahead and do it. And after a few months of it, anyway, we were approached to do the official website. So. I, then the whole thing about the forum came along and it just built up and built up over a few years and it's just gone massive now. It's and um, tell us a small bit about the forum. It's there for the fans and there's over 3,000 members always there. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of members for the forum. And I'd say it's probably, I mean, if you want to a forum there from Shells, you might get one post on it every six hours or something. You want to foot on it, there's one post every three hours. But this thing like post every week on Twitter. Right. But if you want this form here, by the time you post and you go back and look again, there's other five posts. <laughs> Do you think many of the players um, read all it? Of them. All of them. And I know, I know <laughs> yeah, the fact they post them and they tell me that. And so does the chair, and so does the manager. <laughs> Do you think they post? Um, there was a member of the board posting before. I think we'd go to San Miguel, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there was a member of the board posting before, we won't say who was. But he was forced to wasn't he? Yeah, and there's a couple of other people from the club too. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell us, you're a member of the FOCC. Yeah. And um, tell us how did that begin? And the FOCC began, I'd say it began life as the, as the, the CCISA, the Cox City Independent Supporters Association in the early 90s. Um, and the gang, the gang of, of, of people that I go to the games with, that we still go to the games with. I mean, the CCISA kind of, um, you know, became defunct and drifted away after, after a number of years. And, and uh, the the organisation I mean somebody just came up with it, the Friends of Cork City and that, that was a good I thought that was a good uh, moniker to go by you know and it, it was uh, we've added numerous uh, extensions to it over the years but uh, 
There's one particular extension that's quite uh, interesting. What's that? Uh, the uh, the uh, FOCC OFF, the uh, official fans faction of the uh, Friends of Cork City. Yeah, that's a good one, alright. Yeah. Declan, um, we're just about to start quarterfinals of the Cork City Pro Evolution uh, PlayStation game. Can you just tell us where the idea for this came about and how successful it's been? Well, uh, we got a few emails and texts about people saying we should organise a tournament like this, so we just went with the demand really. And there's been huge interest in it, Yeah, right? there's yeah. been uh, good enough interest, not as much as we expected, but it's been successful. Uh, very good. And tell me, we have some high profile players in the quarterfinals as well. Can you tell us some of the players that are after qualifying? I have uh, Cork City midfield superstar Joel Gamble. Is there in the quarterfinals? Hi Joe, um, what's your favourite memory of playing in front of the fans of Thomas Mass? Um, I have, I'd say, two or three really memories that stick out an awful lot. Um, two with Cork City, but one with the international team. Um, my first, probably, biggest memory was, I know it was about six, six years ago, but we played in the Super Cup against Bohemians. I made my debut uh, at one and a half time. I scored after two or three minutes to make one all. It was just the occasion, there was a new manager there, uh, Colin Murphy come in, we just finished the youth team, uh, we won the National Cup, so it was my first kind of taste of, I was a senior level, uh, Air Cup League, and uh, it was a great achievement. Just to uh, come on and score, it was just one of those little boys thing really that I, I always remembered. Um, second moment was probably international, uh, on the 21 against Denmark, it was my first, again my debut for Ireland uh, on the 21. Um, come on again at half time, funny enough, and uh, I scored a winner, we were two, two all scored, Two minutes to go and the place went mental, it was uh, electric really. Uh, but the biggest of all would have to be um, last season when we win the league really. And, um, we head into the Pro Evolution and after say yeah. the confident of some sort of this season? Uh, yeah, I am the champ, like, uh, <laughs> I am unbeaten. So I've won two through to, I haven't had much practice really, so I'm looking forward to getting out the nitty gritty of it. But when I used to spend a lot of time as footballers do, two of the times, uh, I'm a fan, uh, admirer of the old PlayStation and you know, I played quite a lot. So I'm very confident. Yeah. Turner's Cross is a very tight ground. The supporters are right on top of the pitch. There's no greyhound track or anything like that separating. We're banging on top. And you can hear things. I've always been a stand person and I know that I've made comments from the stand at a quiet time and I've seen the players turn around and react, they've heard me. It's been very intimidating, not just for opposition, but for home players as well, because if people think that the home players aren't playing up to this pack, you can hear the abuse given to them as well, so it can be intimidating all around. But I think it's just it's very tight and that Cork people are not shy in expressing their opinions, so you will hear the comment being screamed out. So I think we're kind of lucky we don't have too many microphones on the ground to hear the, co the comments being broadcast live. The intimidation in Turner's Cross won the league last year. When the Derry T City team came out to warm up, the ground was full an hour before kickoff. The game had been sold out a week beforehand. And the boys were out warming up running around the place, looking, waving at their own fans. And next thing, there was one chorus of stand-up, went around the ground. Every person inside in that ground, an hour before kickoff, stood up. You could see Derry, they wilted. They wilted. And that's what Turner's Cross is about. And basically, that one round of stand-up for Cork City, an hour before kickoff, in a packed ground for a big game, done it. It's only this year I've noticed it now because I would have been in the shed and probably up towards the back of the shed for other games. But um, this year now, being down the Derry Nan and being so even closer to the pitch, the European games in particular, or even any team we've played who wouldn't have played in the cross before, and you see a fella coming down to pick up the ball to take a throw in, and the looks on some of their faces, you just they have, they have to be seen to be believed, like because they, they never seen anything like. I mean, I went to see Red Star training, and they strolled in, they were looking at the place, thinking, oh, this is the training ground or something like that. There's no way the fans are going to be this close to the pitch, I suppose, with the kind of hostility that they're used to over there as well, like. But I think what what makes the atmosphere is it's just so Cork. It really is like it's there's the kind of the Cork superiority complex, and there's also there's just there's so, so much wit. Like you know, it's it's even when things are going badly, you know, people start moaning and groaning and whatever. But bef 
before long at some point it always just turns to humour and somebody will crack a joke and everyone will stop whinging and start laughing like you know it's it's just a unique car thing i really think it is like uh, like brian was saying it's unique um, you can travel the country you can go up and down you can go to all the stadiums but the car people do bring a unique aspect to sport always having always well there was one uh, one one trip trip to sligo it was um it was it was late on in the season and uh, Noel O'Mahony was, was the manager at the time and it was like a, a, a particular kind of messy busload of us went up. Uh, uh, it was just like, it was just, I don't know, s like it was a really early start. I think it was like a two o'clock kickoff and uh, I think we had to leave about like five in the morning and about quarter past five, you just hear, <coughs> and it was like, oh, jeez, that's the start of it. Like, of course, you couldn't be um, seen to be you know, n not up for it. Like so, I I think I think I think by the time we got to um, Gort, we were all locked. <laughs> so we decided to um, decided to stop, have a, a rest stop, in a field, and uh, some fella produced a ball. And I remember we had a game of soccer, and it was like north side versus south side, but there was like twenty of us on the bus, and there was only three of us on the south side. So it was seventeen v three, but we got a one all draw out of it. <laughs> I remember one time, myself and Dan, we were hitting out, it started the way, we got to the Moscow Park, you know, this is a fucking funny story. Like. And the bus pulled up, and there was a lot of women, got into the Moscow Park, and he looked at them, fucking bother me. Come on, we went to the Moscow Park, it was a fucking crack. This is true, we got into the Moscow Park, don't ask me who was playing, we've been dolphin over, Sunday as well, whatever. They were all over, we me live. So this, this fellas got a fucking free kick, like, and he, Take a trick to the ball, put the ball down. And you know what I mean? We, we were doing it half in the matches, and the man was fucking around to keep the ball out, like, the goalkeeper, we'd fucking give him a roar, like, yeah. Right? So, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? We'd put the ball down, kick the fucking thing, like. So, we'd dance after, like, you know what I mean? Fucking blew the fucking way, like, you know? Just for a time, you know? You're obviously not regulars, you know, Ronnie. You ain't gonna look at the women, mate. Down near me in, in, in Mahan Black Rock, there, everybody was wearing their Barcelona, Man United, Liverpool, Celtic jerseys, and we won the trophy. And within a few days, all 15 and 20 of the lads, my son included, they were all wearing their city gear, and everybody was, it was going to be, you know, one of the players, they all wanted to be whoever at the time, you know, and, and, and it was just brilliant. And seeing jerseys everywhere. I mean, I, I was coming out to the grounds today and I, I dropped people into the, to the bus station before I came out and there was people wearing city jerseys heading off to Galway. You know, I just think that's the power of the club. Oh, what makes you optimistic for the future, lads? <clears throat> the number of kids sporting in Cork City is, I mean, yeah. just like living out in Blarney now, like if, if I drive over to, to Turner's Cross, you know, I go through by UCC and down through Toker, Ballyfeehan area or whatever like and you see kids running around in the greens in Ballyfeehan and Toker with city jerseys on that's a very very recent thing and like even just in terms of what what you see I remember like when I started going I was sort of what would have been maybe 13, 14 kind of age like and there weren't many people in my age going to Park City Games at the time it was all old fellas are really small kids sort of thing or that's what it seemed like to me at the time there didn't seem to be anybody kind of between sort of 12 and 25 or something like that. Oh, and who's your favourite Cork City player? Uh, Danny Murphy. Why is that? Because I think he plays tough in defence. And Very good. And what was the the best match you were ever at? Uh, way to the Satanta Cup final. Um, the one against Bohemians up in Dublin when we took over the stadium. Can you tell me who your favourite Cork City player is? Um, John O'Flynn. And why do you like him? Because he scores loads of goals. Yeah. 
I think Park City Football Club is it's a lot more than just the whole, the whole team, like you know what I mean? Because I mean, like you make so many friends out of it, kind of you get to know so many people, build up so many contacts, and you like, get so many debts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I mean, there's, there's so much that goes with it. Like, like some of my best friends now I met through Following City, and I mean, like even kind of. I kind of what I'm doing at the moment, I'm like in Red FM sports broadcasting and stuff like kind of following city kind of would get me interested in that as well, you know. And I mean like there's just so many things like you're doing the website, like that's again through city, like, you know. And it kinda it all builds up into a big network and it becomes kind of a big a massive part of your life, I suppose basically. No, we have a good soccer team, we have the best supporters in the country. So why not? Why shouldn't we be up there? Why shouldn't we, you know, brag when we get up there, sing when we get up there? I mean it's it's, it's in our nature, we're car people, we're, we're proud. Well, I remember going through school like, and people would ask, what team do you support, you know, and I, I without a doubt, every time I say Cork City, and they, they were kind of bemused by this. So they'd say, no, no, what team do you really follow? And I said, well, I really follow Cork City because I go to all their matches, you know what I mean? So, I mean, that's what it means to me. It's, it's like people fool themselves if they think they can follow two clubs. You can only follow one club. And the one club you follow, as Frank Skinner said, it's all down to geography. You follow the club where you live closest to. And he's right, because you have no affinity to any of these other clubs. You can pretend you're a Liverpool fan, pretend you're a Manchester United fan, pretend you're a Celtic fan, but really deep down you're only fooling yourself. Winning the league last year was just, you know, it was sort of what I'd invested way too much energy in for the best part of six, seven years of my life and all hoping and praying and God knows what else and for it to finally come through was an amazing release like it was. Well, it's definitely up there with the more important things in my life. Um, it's certainly something that I live and breathe it, the whole thing. People ask me when I'm around one place, who do you support? And I say, Cork City, yeah, but who do you really support? I can't get through the fellas, like, there's only one team I support. I'm not like 90% of people around Ireland that have another team. There's only one team I support and that's it, Cork City. I, th I, th I think the club it, it, it's just there and it's like it's like I think you need constants in your life you know and it's like every weekend checking the city result whether you be you know home or abroad or whatever is like a constant and if it was ever taken away from you it would like be like a chunk of your life would be missing you know I'd, I'd often bring people to people out to the cross and I, and I let it speak for itself you know and you bring you can't bear on a Friday night going out there it's real you know, you pay your pay if you probably going to sit down and you know the enjoyment. You you can't beat it, like you know. Uh, it's uh, as well like it's it's about who who you meet and who you pal around with at the games. I mean, it's 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 a it's a chance to be part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And I think on like last November, it was a, ch a chance to be part of something fantastic. I mean, the, the the cross was packed as as we'd love to see it every single day. Um, but like, I uh, was lucky enough to be squeezed into the shed that night. Like, and when Flynn scored, something in me—the way we were playing up to that stage, something in me like I knew we were going to win. On a tall night, like, I'm walk every tall night, you know. And I'm waiting for, waiting for the next day to come along. And I just, I'm sure that people are, people are just getting their heads up and walking and talking about the following Friday, <laughs> getting ready to go off to Dundalk or Drogheda or go off to Shelburne or go to Derry. And they're waiting for it all week, and then they want to come to that way, like to the other like, I mean, our bus down left yesterday at quarter one, we met about half 11, 12 o'clock, and then from the whole day, and it was just, just like, I can't wait to go up there, like, I can't wait to go up there, match, a couple of points, enjoy the crack with lads. Like, a, a, lot of, a lot of people who go to see City games, I want to say, it's fantastic, because I think the summer soccer has helped, but the colour, the chanting, the flags, it's fantastic, and at the moment, Every time I come down, I have a car full of kids. 
I can't I can't go with the buddies anymore. And, uh, you know, after the game, I have to go go and have a drink. You know, which I uh, you know I was I was quite regularly doing with uh, a lot of my friends. But I, I have my own kids, you know, and uh, they all want to go and and, uh, and neighbours, and they're just sitting over there waving at me. But uh, they're um, you know they're, they're probably five or six of them come with me, and they, they love it. They absolutely love it. And uh, what they'll grow up with is is, is the memories, not not of you know the games because the games kind of you know pass you pass you pass you by at that age but i think it's just the occasion the memory and uh, that's what we have to build for our generation the thing to remember about european trips was that especially for combran combran was the first one the lot of us met and like all those years on we're all stuck together um but european trips are the bonus of being a fan of Cork City, you know, because City fans, we, we go out of our way to enjoy ourselves. Win, lose or draw, we will enjoy ourselves. And once people from the opposition understand, we're out for a good time, the football is secondary, as long as we can make friends. And basically that's what football is all about. You shake hands with whoever's over there, that's it. Today, Cork City means an awful lot to me. It's passion, it's my hobby. Um, I travel the world with them. If I have the money, I would travel everywhere with them. I travelled everywhere for two seasons with them. And the lad said it to me at the end of the season, says, yeah, how many games do you miss the last two years? I said, maybe one in two, in two years. My holidays were based around proxy football though, for the last two years. And I always said it, I said, I got Coxley FC across my back. And I said, if they ever win the league, I'll get champions. 83 0 on my back, and I got it done straight after they won the league last season. Well, to tell you the truth, like, uh, when I went to Cyprus this year, if I had a wish, I wish to relive, to relive uh, those three days all over again and again. It was that special. I wouldn't say it means everything, but it means a lot. Like, I, I've lived abroad. I've lived in New York. I've lived in London. And when I've been abroad, like in New York, I used to get up 10 o'clock in the morning, ring my brother, this game would just be finished in the cross. What's the score? What's the score? Or if I miss that, I'd be online trying to check the results. Getting back here, I've been tempted to move abroad again, but there's one thing that will keep me here, and that's Cork City. I told Stephen and Satan the shed after he won the league last year, and I said, I, I tears in my eyes. I mean, I cried that night, like, you know, when I think back to it, like, I, I mean, I cried the year before when we lost out to Shelburne the last year, you know. I thought, you know, we would never have a shout the year before last, if you remember. Yeah. But I cried when we won that league last year, like, and uh, I turned over to Steve and I said, don't you ever forget this night? I said, hey, don't know to me. She said, I won't. I said, because I was 14 years of age, I said, I was setting one day. I told us, I'm just very proud, I said. I'm the same age as you. I said, enjoy it, I said. And we'll never forget it. He, he, he will never forget that, like. Like, his memory now of that would be what I had when I was grown up, like. You know, you, you can't take that away, like. You know, I hope he, I hope he always follows the League of Ireland as much as I have. Because you can't beat it, like, you can't. Like, I used to go forward on Sunday afternoon, one of the matches, you know, and uh, beat the lads in the crack before the game, the crack after the game, and, you know. Uh, like, we were down through the years being in the pub with Dave Barry and, 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 and Richardson and, and Liam Murphy and Amal, like, and the, and the bench and the crack, you know. And, um, you know, uh, just, I hope he, he, he sticks it and, and, and has the same memories as I have, like, you can't replace them. Like.
really, really drunk. The first half kind of lasted about seven, seven and a half minutes. It was one of them things. But anyway, I think people started sobering up and we figured out we were actually one down. So we better better get our act together and, you know, start supporting the team. So some 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 fella some fella started chanting and I think the chant that came out of his mouth was he wanted to say that Nolo Manny was like great and a brilliant manager and we supported him all the way. But uh, what came out of his mouth was um Nolo Manny is Nolo Manny like which made no sense but it seemed like the perfect thing to chant like in our in our drunken state so the chant of no Lomani is no Lomani started like you know coming out like from and like other city fans just joined in and of course no Lomani looked around like completely confused and kind of like all right right t- like thanks for the support like but um for some reason anyway it spurred him into making a, a substitution and uh, like whatever they won the game 2-1 they got two goals in the last like 11 minutes or whatever so it's like we decided to take credit for the win